Hello, this is Chris Kobe with the League of Women Voters of Portland, and you are watching the Video Voters Guide. The League, in conjunction with Metro East Community Media, are here to talk with the candidates running in the May 2020 primary election. With me today is Rob Fulmer, running for State Representative District 36, which covers Southwest Portland and some of Northwest Portland. Welcome, Rob, and could you please tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for state representative? Uh, sure. Well, thank you very much first for the opportunity to uh, to speak with you guys today. I I so appreciate that you're you're doing these video interviews because with the what's going on in the world, uh, all the normal channels through which people would uh, be able to talk to us are are not. Uh, not operating as usual, so this is a this is a very unusual time to be running for office. So, um, uh, as as you mentioned, my name is Rob Fulmer. I've I've uh, I've been an education worker and education advocate for a long time. For the last 15 years, I've been uh, working to strengthen education at, at Portland State. Um, uh, but I've also been a very active member of uh, of my union, SEIU 503, and I've I've been a strong voice for labor. I'm someone who's uh, who's really fought for low and middle income workers. Uh, I served for for several years on the on the statewide education board. In addition to being uh, being someone who uh, who served for for six years on the uh, city of Portland's co community uh, budget advisory board. So they they have five people that advise the city. I've i I have a lot of experience with state and local government. But the reason that I'm running more than anything else is that I bring the perspective of someone who was brought up by a single mom. Uh, she struggled to support me and my brother on her, on her own when I was growing up. I went to 10 different public schools in three states before I got out of high school. Um, but I was that kid who was always in the library, I had my nose in a book. Uh, I got into a great university, I ended up going to MIT where I got a degree in astronautic engineering. So yes, I am a rocket scientist. And, um, and I've been trying to to strengthen education uh, ever since I ever since I got out of out of out of college. Basically, I've spent my entire career working in education. And the thing that uniquely differentiates me, besides the background that I referenced earlier, is that I really have a handle on higher education policy that I think is unmatched in the field. And at this point, we haven't had a really strong higher education advocate in the legislature for since Michael Dembro. Uh, uh, who ch used to chair the House Higher, uh, Higher Education and Workforce Committee since he moved over to the Senate and started working on other things. So we really need that. Uh, higher education, I think, is going to be uh, undergoing some real stress in the next two to four years. Okay, thank you, Rob. Uh, changing now over to some of the issues, what challenges have been and will be created by the pandemic to the effective and efficient administration of Oregon state government and how do you propose to meet those challenges? Well, I think there are there are multiple challenges, and we're already seeing them. First, the uh, first is that a, a, a large percentage of the Oregon workforce is is being um, being laid off. People are being displaced from work. Um, that's that has a disproportionate impact on on low wage workers and contingent workers. Uh, we hope that there will be assistance from the federal government that's provided to those workers. It's been promised and passed into law, but how long it's going to take for that to get out to people is a is a separate question. Um, so people, I think a lot of people are are really uh, going to be in dire straits, and we're going to be more reliant on government ever uh, than ever to to help those folks uh, make sure that they can make ends meet and continue to feed their families. Um, so what does this mean for the 2021 session? Because whoever's elected into the seat is going to be someone who's going to start serving in January of 2021. There's a lot of work that has to be done before then, but I think we're still going to be uh, uh, certainly going through the aftermath of this, and it's going to be one of the most difficult and challenging budget, budgets that we've seen in the legislature. Now, Oregon has, has the fourth uh, strongest reserve per capita in the nation. There are only a, a handful of resource extraction states that are ahead of us in that. So we do have reserves that, that, that the state should be able to lean on, but they're not going to be enough to make up for the, the huge loss of, of tax revenue that we're going to see as a result of all these folks having been laid off. Uh, I think that it's going to be incumbent on the government to to step up and help people, particularly people who have limited means. But because the state has to bu balance its budgets, they're going to need a strong partner in the federal government in order to backfill that state budget. Otherwise, we're going to be looking at uh, significant cuts to services. Uh, and having to manage 
how to prioritize those, I think, is going to be one of the most important decisions that we're going to ask of our legislators. Thank you, Rob. Uh, traditionally, the legislature has conducted the decennial redistricting process, which will occur next year. Are you comfortable with the current redistricting process? And if not, how would you seek to change it? Well, I think ideally the the redistricting process would be one that is fair and nonpartisan. Um, but uh, I think it's pretty clear at this point that we don't live in an ideal world. And so the redistricting process that we have in, in this state is one where that work is done by the legislature and subject to the 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 kind of work that they do it's it, it can be referred to judicial review that is if if uh one party or the other is in charge and uh they redistrict according to what they think are the best uh, uh outcomes for this for the state and the people in the state and the other party doesn't like that they can sue it goes to the courts and then which is not ideal um but uh i i would say that rather than moving to a nonpartisan uh system in oregon at this point um, I would I would want that to be something that's embraced at a national scale. I don't I, to put it succinctly. I don't believe in unilateral disarmament. I think there are a lot of places in the country where we've seen an issue with gerrymandering and unfair district uh, boundaries drawn. And I would hate to see Oregon uh, move to a system that um, that wasn't reflected more broadly in the country. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um... Let's move to another area. What are your thoughts on cap and trade proposals intended to mitigate climate change? Are they a good idea or not, and why? Uh, great, thank you for the question. Uh, I do think that, uh, that putting a cost on carbon, making polluters pay, is the most sensible way um, that we're gonna be able to move away from fossil fuels quickly. I do think that it, there, there have been some arguments made that uh, cap and trade isn't getting us the level of reductions that we'd like uh, and that we really need in order to be able to, uh, to get uh, carbon usage down to a point where, um, uh, or greenhouse gases down to a point where it's going to have a significant uh, mitigating effect on, on, uh, on climate change. But at the same time, the cap, what we're looking at in Oregon with the clean energy jobs bill and other similar legislation is, is this cap and invest idea is to, to take the revenues that they get from providing these disincentives to these large corporations that are emitting uh, greenhouse gases and, and investing them in a green energy economy. And so I think doing it in that way that, that takes that revenue and rather than sort of returning it to people who are paying or, or otherwise, uh, um, uh, using it to invest it in, in green energy and to transition our economy to a green energy economy is the smartest way we can go about this, which is why I'm strongly in favor of that legislation. Thank you very much, Rob, for your answers to these questions. This has been the Video Voter's Guide, and the primary election is Tuesday, May 19. Be sure to inform yourself about the candidates, the ballot measure, and exercise your right to vote. Thank you for watching.